Good morning. It's good to have all of you here to be a part of this, to be together. I know it's raining out there, but you know, I get up in the morning, I see the rain, I'm thinking of it as cleaning out the air, and then other things come to mind, like, you know, songs that we sing about salvation. You know, have you been washed in the blood? And what can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So think of the rain as something reminds you of the goodness of Christ and how it is that we come to be Christian in the first place, followers of Christ. And don't lament it. Let's celebrate it. So, quite a few passages there. Crazy pastor. I see a common thread running through these. And so I want to tie these together, hopefully, for all of you. And it's good to see, and I just like to look out to see who's here. You know, I don't see this kind of admixture of people in churches that I sometimes go to preach at or that I've served in back in the United States or even here in Korea before I became a chaplain. I think we have something unique in the chapel ministry, in the military ministry program. I think we have a representation of people within our pews, at least within our Christian services, that really speak of the breadth and width of the types of people, the countries, the languages that are represented. And they all, we're all coming together to worship our one God and Savior. And it's such a good thing to see. And I, so I think that when I do retire, I don't, I, I don't think I can go back to a church. Not a denominational church where everybody's kind of the same, maybe the same background, maybe from the same neighborhood. If I'm near a military base, I'll probably still be a part of a chapel service. Because I think we do just a little better at getting at that whole concept of unity and diversity among our people. And I say that as someone who said, I've served in churches before becoming a pastor. I've served in chapels as, as a senior pastor and as a worship, as you know, someone who comes up and helps to read the scriptures and be a co-pastor. And I know that we're not perfect. I mean, I've sat in church elder meetings and parish councils, and I know we're not perfect. I know the human side of both inside and out. And I know that we do have in our chapel system some specialized services that tend to draw one type of people, maybe a younger generation or maybe more of a Pentecostal type. And I'm glad that we have even an admixture of different backgrounds within our chapel here. I, mean, I think I mentioned, maybe I mentioned here before, I know I did when I was preaching down in Daegu, but when I... My family is traditionally Episcopalian, and when we actually met Christ, received Jesus as our Savior, my mom took us to Assemblies of God Church, and then when I joined the military the first time, I, depending on where I was at, going to a school, I might attend a Lutheran church, I might be in a chapel service. When I was in Korea, the, way back in the 80s, I, helped with, I would go off post and help with the Baptist mission, and then after I got married and actually became an ordained minister, I ended up in the Presbyterian side. So if you want to sing and dance and hold your hands, I'm good with that. If the coming of the Holy Spirit and taking you over as a Presbyterian is shown only in the raising of your eyebrows, I can accept that. <laughs> I mean, going like this is like shouting hallelujah in a Pentecostal church. I can see it. God's there. But to look at, out over the chapel and to see so many from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different languages, you know, it's, it's quite unique to have. I mean, even in my military structure, where I'm serving now, my commander is a Vietnamese in background. The department head, the, the deputy commander I fall under, 
for uh, my department is an African-American female. I walk through the hospital and I, ha I run into staff members that are from the Philippines, that are from American Samoa, that are from Ukraine, that are from China, not just like Taiwan or Hong Kong, but I mean mainland China, Jamaica, nations of Africa, and of course we have patients that come in from many other countries. So our chapel services are very unique. And I would argue that a chapel service gets closer to and has a better potential to truly be a house of worship that God intended, a place of prayer for all nations. And I see this unity and diversity, as I said, as a common thread running through our scriptures today from Old Testament to, to the letters of Paul. And I'm even going to throw in something else that Paul wrote from 1 Corinthians right into the Revelation. But though we, but because we reading just snippets of scripture, I would also encourage you to go back and read the full passages, the full books. These are just tidbits of scripture. And I want you to get the full context and even come up with questions. Don't just take it and walk away with it, but be like the Jews that were in Berea when Paul came and he taught them they, it sounded so good, and they wanted what Paul was teaching, but they went back to Scripture, and they compared it to his teaching to what the Scripture said, and then they came back and said, okay, Paul, we can accept it. Do that for yourself. Be responsible for your faith and your growth in Christ. Come here by all means, and hopefully we're feeding you, and be in the Word. Ingest it for yourself. But let's go on to our scriptures for today. Back in Genesis, when God called Abram, whom we know later became to be called Abraham, when God called Abram, he promised before the law was even given that through Abraham, Abram's descendants, God would bring about a blessing to the nations, not just to the people that he had called out, that he was making his own through Abram, but that they would be a blessing to all the nations. It was a promise wherein the division of the people into many nations that had happened at the Tower of Babel just a chapter before would be undone. And yet as time went on, the people of God ended up secluding others from God, especially those other nations, those who are non-Jews. By the time of Jesus, the Jews had established a policy of how close outsiders and how close Jews by gender could get to God. And Jesus came to the temple that was being run in his day, and he saw these vendors in the courts, and he came in and he disrupted that business. And he said, it's written, my house will be called a house of prayer, yet it had become a den of robbers. A place where walls keeping people from God and God from peoples had been erected, both physically as well as legally. This contrary to the intent of God's promise and God's command to Abram to be a blessing to all nations. Unfortunately, no matter the actions of human beings, God fulfills his promises. And by the crucifixion of Jesus and his shed blood, all walls would at last be torn down and salvation made available to all peoples everywhere so that Babel is undone. We still need to work on that, but Christ has accomplished the work already. In Galatians, after the enemy of Christ's followers, Saul, was converted and given the name Paul, Paul, using what we call the Old Testament and even tying into some of the literature of his day, proclaimed that in Christ all may approach close to God. In a 180-degree turn from the way he had been raised in his religion, after having met Christ for himself, Paul wrote that separations in the body of Christ were not acceptable. The promise to Abram was continued and fulfilled in Jesus, which meant inclusion of all, Greek and Jew, male and female, all so socioeconomic classes and statuses. 
Paul preached that walls were broken down in Christ and access to God truly was to be for all peoples and all nations. In fact, to bring in a most challenging scripture, the one I mentioned from 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote in response to them going to court with one another, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters, and this is a prelude to that challenging part. At least it's a challenge to me. Maybe it's not so much to you. It's a challenge to me. It continues on. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who sleep with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And often this passage, if it's ever preached on, is used to target or to reinforce God's judgment on certain lifestyles, to justify walls. Walls that, that I tend to justify. Walls that are easy for me to erect to keep someone from God. The last part of this verse itself may be left off, except perhaps when speaking of the power of Christ to work generally. Forgetting to put myself in that is the one Christ is working through, but just generally talking about Christ, the power in someone's life, that, and it says that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That is great news, but I'm involved in that somewhere. So the challenge presented to me, to someone that others will categorize as being conservative, is just that one sentence, and that is what some of you were. The good news is Christ can radically change someone's life. Amen? Your life has been changed by Christ, yes? Now maybe for some of you that was an easy step and it wasn't a radical change of life, but once you've accepted Christ, you've become a radical. The world won't see you the same way. They won't accept what you have to say. And then I go back to this passage in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and I ask myself, how did those living such lifestyles hear about Christ in the first place? How did they come to accept him to be washed, sanctified, and justified? Well, it was through believers in Corinth, as, as bad as some of them were in the way that they lived, it was those who brought this good news person to person to those living in those lifestyles such that some of them wanted to know Christ. Walls are to be broken down and to be broken down by the organic body of Christ known as the church by making Christ known rather than closing him off until such a time as a person cleans himself up. Ever had that said to you? You ever said it to somebody else? Before you can come to church, you need to buy a suit. You need to clean yourself up. You need to stop acting the way you're acting. And where in there did they ever meet Christ? So the challenge to me is that I like some walls. <laughs> I feel some walls are justified and right to erect. And there is a wall there that really we can't tear down. There's that wall that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one could come to the Father except through him. That's a wall some people have to get over, and we're there to help them get, it o get over it. We shouldn't have other walls that keep them once they come over that wall, once they come around that wall, once they get past that wall from living in Christ. And then I look at myself in the mirror and say, oh, I might be a sinner, that's true. <laughs> but you know what? I'm not as bad as... Let me hold it. <laughs> I'm not as bad as some. 
I haven't done all these different lifestyles. Oh, I might have swindled somebody something once, but I'm not living a different lifestyle. And yet, Paul lists them all together. So, when I look at myself in the mirror and I do that, and there's some twisted logic that's going on uh, saying that I can withhold salvation because I'm protecting God, and it seems rational. And yet, at this passage points out, there is no one whom God will not clean up when they come to him through Christ. That he can change lives and change lives radically. They just have to accept Christ. Not my job to change your life radically. That's Christ's job. But I sure have a part in leading you to know Christ, in making you want to know Christ, or giving you something to attract you to Christ. Like the Corinthians, I'm to be about presenting Christ daily such that he becomes a delightful fragrance to even the worst of offenders. And this passage in Corinthians tells us that we, are in, we who are in Christ are the sent ones. We are the ones making straight the path of salvation. How is the church tearing down walls today? Is it, are we doing that? We are the church. I think we do a better job at this as a chapel community. And I know it can be pointed out that, we can, that we're not perfect. But I think we do a better job. You know, I heard a story a few days ago from a Catholic priest that I work with. When he was stationed in Louisiana and he went off post to celebrate Mass, he went to a church, celebrated Mass, and he walked out to church and down the street and celebrated Mass at another church. You know what the only difference was between those churches? You can participate here if you want to as the audience. <laughs> one was white, one was black. And he's Nigerian. <laughs> Welcomed in both churches, and yet they celebrated in two different locations within walking distance apart. The barriers that I thought existed to keep me from God, you know, they turned out not to exist in Christ. Walls within the body of Christ do exist. I see a greater opportunity, perhaps, a unity and diversity in our chapel settings to help turn, tear down those walls that exist. At least I thought there were walls that existed. You know, when I was at the age of 12 and I came to know Christ, I came, I was pretty, even at the age of 12, I was dirty, a sinner, an enemy of God. But you know what? God welcomed me by his grace. He washed and sanctified and justified me by my Lord Jesus Christ so that those barriers didn't exist. Because Jesus tore them down as assuredly as the curtain in the temple was torn in half from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross, opening up access to God, removing the barrier. I, as a Christ follower, am to be about the business of tearing down walls that others may be led to repentance and included in the kingdom of God. And as we come to the end of the thread with the Revelation 7 passage, we're given a picture of the end times. Before God are assembled all nations, all people groups, praising God in all languages, there are no walls barring them from approaching God. There is no color of skin not representative. There is no one class of people mentioned. There is no one tongue by which people praise God. There is no one banner to be flown by which people are accepted by God except the banner of love dipped in the blood of Christ 
that washes and sanctifies and justifies all peoples. No walls, no barriers, one organic body of Christ. The life in Jesus that is to be represented now on this earth as it will assuredly be one day in heaven in which we speak to and we say, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All the nations blessed, no Jew, no Greek, no rich, no poor, no slave, no free, no man, no woman, excluded. One people of every tongue and tribe worshiping God together. This thread of unity and diversity runs through the community of Christ from Old Testament to New Testament to end times to create a church without walls. It's not a lofty ideal, it's an achievable outcome. Not achievable by us in works alone, but by the work of Christ in us. Are there self-justified walls that you build to keep people from God? Are there people to whom you add burdens to keep them from Christ? As challenging as it might be, we, brothers and sisters, are to be about the business of tearing down walls that Christ may be an attractive fragrance to the unsaved so that some will be drawn to him through the Spirit working in us, be washed and sanctified and justified that the kingdom of heaven be expanded and the Father glorified. So why are you here? Go and be about your father's business. And let us pray. Gracious is a word that doesn't even begin to capture who you are, Lord God Almighty. Even while I was yet an enemy, you provided a way for me to be acceptable in your sight and to be accepted into your presence. Lord, forgive me for the obstacles I may have created, thinking I am doing the right thing, thinking I am protecting the church, thinking I am keeping you from being soiled. Instead of leading and attracting others, to know the Christ that you allowed me to meet through someone else. Help me, Lord, not to erect walls and to preach the truth that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life in such a way that others will yet be attracted, find him pleasing, and want to know him. And thank you, Lord, that you did not stop me from coming to Christ. Help me now, Lord, to lead others in all that I do and all that I say, wherever it is I may be, that the kingdom of God be expanded. Help me, O Lord, through the power of the Spirit to proclaim Christ and him crucified and to bring the good news that in Jesus, lives can change. I pray this in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.